Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Unit A Collaborate session. And I hope that you'll enjoy this recording and enjoy your Thanksgiving this week. Tonight, we're going to sort of review some, some few things that we discussed in the Unit 6 Collaborate session, just so that you could get, uh, again, review your information for the Unit 8 presentation. And this slide deck will also be available to you uh, along with this recording. So these are the items that should be included in your presentation, an introduction, a competitive analysis, and marketing strategies. And the Unit 8 presentation should include the product and service pricing distribution place and both traditional and digital marketing strategies. And in addition to that, these are the headings as well that you should have, which are competitive advantage, ethical stance of the company. Conclusion uh, should provide the recommendations for the company with respect to future marketing strategies. And remember to include topics involving all four Ps. The presentation needs to be at least five minutes, but not more than six minutes in length. And this means you'll need to condense most of the important parts for your audience. So that'll mean you'll have to give it some thought because you will have uh, more slides than you will minutes. And at the end of the presentation, make a compelling case uh, for support for your plan. In other words, ask for the audience's uh, pre uh, support and uh, permission to go forward. You're asking for their resources. So remember that this must be at least 12 slides in length, not counting the title slides. So that would be a total of 13 slides minimum and include the speaker's notes. So that will further explain the information on each slide. And if outside sources are used, follow APA style. As we talked about last in the last presentation, there are a couple of options that you can select from. And uh, here are the options here. The ones that are most used are the using the record audio option in PowerPoint, which is option number two. But we have had students who have actually turned this into a video and posted it on YouTube and provided the URL uh, from YouTube as their assignment. So that's acceptable too. And uh, again, make sure that you submit your PowerPoint assignment with with the notes showing along with your PowerPoint presentation, whether it's a video or whether it's a PowerPoint presentation with synchronous audio as well. And again, if you're watching this presentation in the present presenter mode, you can these links are live and you can click on them to find out the additional information you may require in terms of uh, creating an effective video presentation. Okay, chapter 11 is all about pricing. And we're going to learn about how the role that pricing plays because it's one of the most important aspects of marketing because it's really what determines the level of revenue that you're going to receive. A pricing that is too high can limit sales and a pricing that is too low can limit profits. So we're going to look into that tonight. Traditionally, price has operated as a major determinant of buyer choice and consumers and purchasing agents who have access to price information and price discounters put pressure on retailers to lower prices. And retailers in turn put pressure on manufacturers to lower their prices. And the result could be a marketplace characterized by heavy discounting and sales promotion. And for over 25 years, the internet has been changing the way buyers and sellers interact. And the internet has enabled buyers to make instant price comparisons from thousands of vendors. Moreover, using smart mobile devices, customers can easily make price comparisons in stores 
before deciding whether to purchase, pressure the retailer to match or better the price, or buy elsewhere. And so using promotional platforms such as Groupon, customers can also pool their resources to get better pricing. Purchase decisions are based on how consumers perceive prices and what they consider the current actual price to be, not the marketer's stated price. Customers may have a lower price threshold below the prices uh, signal inferior or unacceptable quality and an upper price threshold above which prices are prohibitive and the product appears not worth the money. Different people interpret prices in different ways. Reference prices, although consumers may have fairly good knowledge of price ranges, surprisingly few can accurately recall specific prices. When examining products, however, they often employ reference prices, comparing an observed price to an internal reference price they remember or an external frame of reference such as posted regular retail price. When consumers evoke one or more of these frames of reference, their perceived price can vary from, stated, uh, from the stated price. Another form of pricing is image pricing. Many customers use price as an indicator of quality. Image pricing is especially effective with ego-sensitive products such as perfumes, expensive cars, and designer clothing. And finally, price cues. Many sellers believe prices should end in an odd number. Customers perceive an item priced at $299 to be in the $200 rather than $300 range. They tend to process prices left to right rather than by rounding. And price uh, encoding is in this fashion uh, is important if there is a mental price break at the higher rounded price. Another explanation for the popularity of nine endings is that they suggest a discount or bargain. So if a company wants a high price image, they should avoid the odd ending tactic. A firm must set a price for the first time when it develops a new product. When it introduces its regular product into a new distribution channel or geographic area, and when it enters bids on new contract work. In defining the pricing objective, the company first decides where it wants to position its market offering. The clearer a firm's objectives, the easier it is to set price. Four common pricing objectives are current profit, market penetration, market skimming, and quality leadership. Short-term profit. Many companies try to set a price that will maximize current profits. They estimate the demand and costs associated with alternative prices and choose the price that produces maximum current profit cash flow or rate of return on investment. Market penetration. Some companies want to maximize their market share. They believe a higher sales volume will lead to unit costs and higher long run profit. So they set the lowest price, assuming the market is price sensitive. Texas Instruments famously practiced the penetration pricing for years, and the company would build a large plant and its plant and its price as low as possible, win a large market share, experience falling costs, and cut the price further as costs fell. Market skimming. Companies unveiling a new technology favor setting high prices to maximize market skimming. Sony has been a frequent practitioner of market skimming prices in which prices start high and slowly drop over time. Quality leadership. A company might aim to be the quality product quality leader in the market. Many brands strive to be affordable luxuries. Products or services characterized by high levels of perceived quality, 
taste and status with a price just high enough not to be out of consumers' reach. Nonprofit and public organizations may have other pricing objectives. A university aims for partial cost recovery, knowing that it must rely on private gifts and public grants to cover its remaining costs. A nonprofit hospital might aim for full cost recovery in its pricing. A nonprofit theater company might price its productions to fill the maximum number of seats. A social service agency may set a service price geared to a client income. Determining demand. Each price will lead to a different level of demand and have a different impact on companies' marketing objectives. The normal inverse relationship between price and demand is captured in a demand curve. The higher the price, the lower the demand. For prestige goods, the demand curve sometimes slopes upward. Some consumers take the higher price to signify a better product. However, if the price is too high, demand may fall. To estimate the demand for a company's offering, marketers need to know how responsive or elastic demand is to, cha to change to a change in price. Price elasticity of demand reflects the degree to which a change in price leads to a change in quanti quantity sold. And the lower the price elasticity, the less sensitive consumers are to price increases and the more likely it is that raising the price can increase sales revenues. Figure 11.1 shows inelastic and elastic demand. In demand curve A, a price increase from 10 to $15 leads to a relatively small decline in demand from 105 to 100. In demand curve B, the same price increase leads to a substantial drop in demand from 150 to 50. If demand hardly changes with a small change in price, we say it is inelastic. If demand changes considerably, it is elastic. consumers are slow to change their buying habits. Four, consumers think the higher prices are justified by factors such as the cost of creating the product, product scarcity, and government taxation. Five, the expenditure is a smaller part of the buyer's total income or the total cost of the end product. And six, part of all the cost is borne by another party. Graph A is titled inelastic demand. The horizontal axis is labeled quantity demanded per period and the vertical axis is labeled price. The graph shows a sloping line from top left to bottom right passing through $115 and $105, $10. Two horizontal dashed lines and two vertical dashed lines intersect the sloping line at $100. $15 and $105, $10. Graph B is titled Elastic Demand. The horizontal axis is labeled Quantity Demanded Per Period. The graph shows a sloping line from top left to bottom right, passing through $50 at $15 and $150 at $10. Two horizontal dashed lines and two vertical dashed lines intersect the sloping line at $50 at $15 and 150 at $10 respectively. Demand sets a ceiling on the price the company can charge for its product. Cost sets the floor. The company wants to charge a price that covers its cost of producing, 
distributing and selling the product, including a fair return for its effort and risk. A company's costs take two forms, fixed and variable. Fixed costs are also known as overhead, are costs that do not vary with production, with the production level or sales revenue. A company must pay bills each month for rent, heat, interest, salaries, and so on, regardless of the output. Variable costs vary differently, vary directly with the level of production. For example, each tablet computer produced by Samsung incurs the cost of plastic and glass, microprocessor chips, and other electronics and packaging. Total cost consists of the sum of the fixed and variable costs for any given level of production. Average cost is the cost per unit in that level of production. It equals total costs divided by production. Management wants to charge a price that will at least cover the total production costs at a given level of production. To price intelligently, Management needs to know its costs vary with different levels of production. Take the case in which a company such as Samsung has built a fixed plant to produce 1,000 tablet computers a day. The cost per unit is high if few units are produced per day. As production approaches 1,000 units per day, the average cost falls because the fixed costs are spread over more units. Short run average costs increase after 1,000 units, however, because the plant becomes inefficient. Workers must line up for machines getting into each other's way and machines break down more often. If Samsung believes it can sell 2,000 units per day, it should consider building a larger plant. And the plant, could do, the plant will use more efficient machinery and work arrangements and the unit cost of producing 2,000 tablets per day will be lower than the unit cost of producing 1,000 per day. In fact, a 3,000 capacity plant would be even more efficient, but a 4,000 daily production plant would be less so because of increasing the, this economies of scale. There are too many workers to manage and paperwork slows things down. In fact, a 3,000 daily production plant is the optimal size if demand is strong enough to support this level of production. Suppose Samsung runs a plant that produces 3,000 tablets, computers per day. As the company gains experience producing tablets, its methods improve. Workers learn shortcuts, materials flow more smoothly, and procurement costs fall. The result, as figure 16.3 shows, is that average cost falls with accumulated production experience. Thus, the average cost of producing the first 100,000 tablets is $100 per tablet. When the company has produced its first 200,000 tablets, the average cost has fallen to $90. And after this accumulated production experience, tablet uh, doubles again to 400,000. The average cost is $80. This decline in average cost with accumulated production experience is called the experience curve or learning curve. Now suppose these firms compete in this particular tablet market, Samsung A and B. Samsung is the lowest cost producer at $80, having produced 400,000 units in the past. If all three firms sell the tablet for $100, Samsung makes $20 per profit per unit. A makes $10 per unit, and B breaks even. The smart move for Samsung would be to lower the price to $90, and this would drive B out of the market, and even A may consider leaving. Samsung will pick up the business that would have gone to B and possibly A. Furthermore, price sensitive customers will enter the market at the lower price. As production increases beyond 400,000 units, and then Samsung costs will drop still further and faster, more than restoring its profits even at the price of $90.
If the firm's offer contains features not offered by the nearest competitor, it should evaluate their worth to the customer and add that value to the competitor's price. If the competitor's offer contains some features not offered by the firm, the firm should subtract their value from its own price. Now the firm can decide whether it can charge more, the same, or less than the competitor. Companies offering the powerful combination of low price and high quality are capturing the hearts and wallets of consumers all over the world. Value players such as Aldi, JetBlue Airways, and Southwest Airlines are transforming the way consumers of nearly every age and income level purchase groceries, apparel, airline tickets, financial services, and other goods and services. Given the customer's demand schedule, the cost function, and competitor's prices, the company is now ready to select a price. Companies select a pricing method that increases, that includes rather, one or more of these three considerations. The most elementary pricing method is to add a standard markup to the product's cost. Construction companies submit job bids by estimating the total project cost and adding a standard markup for profit. Lawyers and accountants typically price by adding a standard markup on their time and costs. Assume the manufacturer wants to earn a 20% markup on sales. The manufacturer will charge dealers $20 per toaster and make a profit of $4 per unit. If dealers want to earn 50% on their selling price, they will mark up the toaster 100% to $40. In target return pricing, the firm determines the price that yields its target rate of return on investment. Public utility will need to make a fair return on investment, often use this method. Suppose the toaster manufacturer has invested $1 million in the business and wants to set a price to earn a 20% return on investment, specifically $200,000. A target return price of $20 is calculated by the formula on this slide. The manufacturer can prepare a break-even chart to learn what would happen at other sales levels. Figure 11.2 shows a break-even chart for determining target return price and break-even volume. Fixed costs are $300,000 regardless of sales volume. Variable costs, not shown in the figure, rise with volume. Total costs equal the sum of fixed and variable costs. The total revenue curve starts at zero and rises with each unit sold. The total revenue and total cost curves cross at 30,000 units. This is the break-even volume. The horizontal axis is labeled sales volume in units, thousands, and the vertical axis is labeled dollars in thousands, and the horizontal axis ranges from zero to 50 in increments of 10 units and the vertical axis ranges from 0 to 1,200 in increments of 200 units. And the graph shows a rising line labeled total revenue through 0 at 0 cost, or price rather, 30 at 500, 50 at 900. Another rising line labeled total cost passes through 0 at 300, intersecting total revenue at a point 30 at 500 and 50 at 600. The point of intersection of the two lines is labeled break-even point. It shows a horizontal line labeled fixed cost at 0, 0,300. Two dashed vertical lines intersected the rising lines at 30 at 500 and 50 at 900 respectively. The distance between the total revenue lines and the total cost is marked with the right brace and labeled large or target profit. All values are estimated.
An increasing number of companies now base their price on customers' perceived value. Companies must deliver the value promised by their value proposition, and the customer must perceive this value. All firms and industries that sell a common a commodity such as steel, paper, or fertilizer normally charge the same price. Smaller firms follow the leader, changing their prices when the market leader's prices change, rather than when their own demand or costs change. Some may charge a small premium or discount, but they preserve the difference. Competitive pricing is quite popular. Where costs vary and are, are difficult to measure, when demand fluctuates or when competitive response is uncertain, firms feel competitive pricing is a good solution because they believe it reflects the industry's collective wisdom. Auction pricing is growing more popular especially with scores of electronic marketplaces selling everything from pigs to used cars as firms dispose of excess inventories or, or used goods. These are the three major types of auctions and their separate pricing procedures. English auctions, ascending bids, have one seller and many buyers. On sites such as eBay and Amazon.com, the seller puts up an item and bidders raise their offer prices until the top price is reached. Dutch auctions or descending bids feature one seller and many buyers or one buyer and many sellers. In the first kind, an auctioneer announces a high price for a product and then slowly decreases the price until a bidder accepts. In the other, the buyer announces something he or she wants to buy, and potential sellers compete to offer the lowest price. Sealed bid auctions let would-be suppliers submit only one bid. They cannot know the other bids. The U.S. and other governments often use the method to procure supplies or to grant licenses. Pricing methods narrow the range from which company must select its final price. Companies usually do not set a single price, but rather develop a pricing structure that reflects variations in geographic demand and costs, market segment requirements, purchase timing, order levels, delivery frequency, guarantees, service contracts, and other factors. Price discrimination occurs when a company sells a product or service at two or more prices that do not reflect a proportional difference in costs. In first degree price discrimination, the seller charges each customer a separate price depending on the intensity of his or her demand. In second degree price discrimination, the seller charges less to buyers of larger volumes. With certain services such as cell phone service, however, tiered pricing results in consumers actually paying more with higher levels of usage. In third degree price discrimination, the seller charges different amounts to different consumer segments. In third degree price discrimination, the seller charges different amounts to different customer segments as the, in the following cases. Customer segment pricing. Different customer segments pay different prices for the same product or service. For example, museums often charge a lower admissions fee to students and senior citizens. Product form pricing. Different versions of the product are priced differently, but not in proportion to their costs. Channel pricing. Coca-Cola carries a different price depending on whether the consumer purchases it from a fine restaurant, a fast food restaurant, or a vending machine. Location pricing. The same product is priced differently at different locations. 
even though the cost of offering it is the same at all locations. Time pricing. Prices vary by season, day, or hour. Restaurants charge early bird customers less and some hotels charge less on weekends. Marketers must modify their price setting logic when the product is part of a product mix. In product mix pricing, the firm searches for a set of prices that maximize profits on the total mix. The process is challenging because the various products have demand and cost interrelationships and are subject to different degrees of competition. We can distinguish six main situations calling for product mix pricing. Loss leader pricing, optional feature pricing, captive product pricing, two-part pricing, byproduct pricing, and product bundling pricing. Several circumstances might lead to a firm to cut prices. One is excess, excess plant capacity. The firm needs additional business and cannot generate it through increased sales effort, product improvement, or other measures. Companies sometimes initiate price cuts in the drive to dominate the market through lower costs. Either the company starts with lower costs than its competitors, or it initiates price cuts in the hope of gaining market share and lower costs. Cutting prices to keep customers or beat com competitive competitors often encourage customers to demand price concessions, however, and train salespeople to offer them. A successful price increase can raise profits considerably. A major circumstance providing provoking price increases is cost inflation. Rising costs unmatched by productivity gains squeeze profit margins and head and lead companies to regular rounds of price increases. Companies often raise their prices by more than the cost increases in anticipation of further inflation or government price controls in a practice called anticipatory pricing. Another factor leading to price increases is over demand. When a company cannot supply all its customers, it can raise prices, ration supplies, or both. The introduction or change of any price can provoke a response from customers, competitors, distributors, suppliers, and even government. Competitors are most likely to react when the number of firms is few. The product is homogenous and buyers are highly informed. How can a firm anticipate a competitor's reactions? Well, one way is to assume the competitor reacts in the standard way to a price being set or changed. Another is to assume the competitor treats each price difference or change as a fresh challenge and reacts according to self-interest at the time. How should a firm respond to a competitor's price cut? It depends on the situation. The company must consider the product stage in the life cycle, the importance of the company's portfolio, the competitor's intentions and resources, the market's price and quality sensitivity, the behavior of costs with volume, and the company's alternative opportunities. Incentives are sales promotion tools, mostly short particular products or services by consumers or the trade. Sales promotion expenditures increased as a percentage of budget expenditure or for a number of years, with the fastest growing area being digital coupons and discounts redeemed via smartphone or downloaded to a consumer, consumer's printer. Sales promotion can produce a high sales response in the short run, but little permanent gain over the longer term. Price promotions usually do not build permanent total category volume, having turned 
to a 0% financing, hefty cash rebates, and special lease programs during sluggish economic times. Auto manufacturers have found it difficult to wean customers from discounts ever since. Managers need to monitor the proportion of customers receiving discounts. The average discount and any tendency for salespeople to rely too heavily on discount. To this end, managers should conduct a net price analysis to arrive at the real price of the offering. The objectives of incentives derived from basic marketing objectives for the offering. Depending on whether a manufacturer's promotional activity is focused on consumers or retailers, incentives have different objectives. For consumer obje incentives, objectives include encouraging the frequent purchases of the purchase of larger size units among users, fostering trial of one's product among non-users, and attracting switchers away from competitors' brands. For retailer incentives, objectives include persuading the retailer or wholesaler to carry a, the brand, persuading the retailer or wholesaler to carry more units than the normal amount, inducing retailers to promote the brand by featuring display or price reductions, and motivating retailers and their sales clerks to push the product. In deciding to use a particular incentive, marketers must first determine its size. The incentive must be meaningful to target market customers if the promotion is to succeed. Second, the marketing manager must establish conditions for participation in incentives might be offered to everyone or to select groups. Third, the marketer must decide on the duration of the promotion. And fourth, the marketer must choose a distribution vehicle. A 50 cents off coupon can be distributed in a product package, in stores, by mail, online, or in advertising. Fifth, the marketing manager must establish the timing of the promotion. And finally, the total sales promotion budget must be set. In addition to determining the size of incentives, a firm must decide how to allocate resources and, specifically, how much effort to devote to push activities and how much to pull activities. A push strategy uses the manufacturer's sales force, trade promotion money, and other means to induce intermediates to carry, promote, and sell the product to end users. A pull strategy, the manufacturer uses advertising, promotion, and other forms of communication to persuade consumers to demand the product from intermediaries, thus inducing the intermediaries to order it. The sales promotion planner should take into account the type of market, the sales promotion objectives, the competitive conditions, and each tool's cost effectiveness. Manufacturers award money to distribution channel members in the form of trade incentives. Unlike consumer incentives that aim to create greater value for buyers, trade incentives aim to increase the attractiveness of the offering for the members of the distribution channel, wholesalers, retailers, and dealers. Manufacturers who often find it difficult to police retailers to make sure they are doing what they agreed to do increasingly insist on proof of performance before paying any allowances. Manufacturers face several challenges in managing trade promotions. Some retailers are doing forward buying, that is, buying a greater quantity during the deal period than they can immediately sell. Companies spend billions of dollars on Salesforce promotion tools to gather leads, impress and reward customers, and motivate the Salesforce. 
Salesforce incentives aims to encourage the sales force to support new product or model boosting prospecting and stimulating off season sales. Sales contracts are one popular type of sales force incentive. A sales contract aims at inducing the sales force or dealers to increase sales results over a stated period with prizes, money, trips, gifts, or points giving to those who succeed. Well, this concludes our discussion on pricing. If there are any questions, please contact me at, uh, by email or give me a call. If you got any questions, I wish you much luck on your unit eight presentation. I'm looking forward to seeing all of them. And remember until then, I'll see you in class. Stay safe, everybody.